George Fry, you are a businessman living in China. I am. And what sort of business do you do? All kinds. I have a couple of factories of my own, and I act as an agent, putting British companies in touch with Chinese companies who can manufacture things for them. What kind of things? Oh, the whole gamut, everything from computer parts to children's dolls. Well, that's a pretty wide range. And it's very easy to get them mixed up. <laughs> When I started, I sent out six batches of computers which would sometimes go to sleep. <laughs> well, computers do that, though, don't they? <laughs> Not after they've said mama and peed on the desk. <laughs> well, why did you choose to go to China, particularly? Well, a number of reasons. I was in the city for a time, but yeah. there was a bit of a misunderstanding about insider dealing. Yeah. Uh, so I thought it was time to move on. Mm. And it seemed to me that China was very much where the action is. I in what sense? Well, if you're looking for what makes the good life, you have to look at China. Well, you say what makes a good life, but... Aren't Chinese people largely still poor and disadvantaged? Well, I don't mean the good life for Chinese people. <laughs> I mean the good life for the British. Oh. The British now wouldn't accept being without mobile phones or plasma TVs. Imagine life without being able to text dirty jokes to each other or, or without watching celebrity wife swap. No, well, intolerable. It would be. <laughs> Well, what I like about the Chinese, or at least the Chinese I've come across, is that they're prepared to work very hard, one, yeah. and two, all they think about is money. I think that's very healthy. Mm. <laughs> if we had more like that in Britain, it would be a far better place. Yeah, the funny thing is, there are no famous Chinese companies, are there? There are no global Chinese brands. Well, that's true. I mean, everybody knows computer brands like Apple and Dell. And nobody's ever heard of Chinese companies like Comtal and Inventec. No. Yet no. five Chinese companies make 90% of all laptops for American brands. I've been at Inventec and seen three competing American computer brands coming off the same production line. And uh, does the government, the Chinese government, do they encourage this? They set up special export processing zones, and the stuff that's made for export is free from duties, free from taxes. Uh, that's why I'm here. Uh, that's what I call capitalism. And, and yet it's, it's a communist country. The, the party still has the ultimate control. Doesn't that make you feel um, uncomfortable? <laughs> so long as the communists let the market rip, I can live with that. <laughs> And the advantage of party control is that at least it's obvious who you go to for decision, and if it's necessary, who to bribe. <laughs> and you're not worried about China's foreign policy? For instance, its support for a Sudanese government, which is accused of genocide in Darfur? Oh, for heaven's sake. Business is business. China buys oil from Sudan, that's all. Just because you buy oil from somebody doesn't mean you support them. I buy apples from my greengrocer. I don't ask him if he beats up his wife. <laughs> but the, the basic economic fact is that Chinese products are cheap because Chinese workers are badly paid and overworked, isn't that right? Listen, I directly employ about a thousand people in my factories. Fifty of them are European, the rest are Chinese. My Chinese workers have a great life. Do they? Do they what, what's the normal day like? Well, they work 12-hour shifts, seven days a week. Yeah. <laughs> they have two meal breaks a day, food provided by me, subsidized by me. When the shift's over, they get on their bikes and go to the company dormitories provided by me. They go to sleep, they wake up, get on their bikes, and go back to work. It doesn't sound much of a life, I must say. I mean, there doesn't seem much point to it. Well, of course there's point to it. Each of my workers has a little signboard over their workstation. If they fulfil their quota for the day, they get a red star on the board. If they don't, they get a black one. And the point is not to get more than one black star a month. Otherwise, 
If that's not a point, I don't know what is. <laughs> but you can't... You can't argue against the fact that Chinese workers are seriously underpaid. What would they spend their money on? <laughs> they get free food in my canteen, or nearly free, <laughs> a free bed in the dormitory, and the Chinese have got a different attitude to money. They're thrifty, they want to save. Not like the Brits, splashing it all on two weeks vomiting in Cyprus. <laughs> Why do the Chinese save so much? I mean, is it just thriftiness? Is it a natural, national characteristic? Well, it's partly that, yeah, but it's mainly it's sheer desperation. Mm. There's no state pension, you know, no free health service, so they're terrified of getting sick and getting old. I think that keeps them disciplined. Yeah. <laughs> so I take it that you would be... Um, well, let's say, lukewarm in the matter of workers' representation. I mean, from what you say, you wouldn't be in favour of trade unions. What do you mean? There are trade unions in China, properly recognised. They're all affiliated to the All China Federation of Trade Unions. Which is affiliated to the Communist Party. Well, to make sure they act responsibly. <laughs> I mean, our unions could do with a bit of that attitude instead of holding everybody to ransom all the time. Well, that, that, is that a fair description? Certainly it's fair. All it takes is for a bit of paper to fall on a guard's head in a tube station, and what do you get? All kinds of grief. And Bob Crow and Tony Woodley threatening to pull their members out. <laughs> I mean, has, has, has nobody in China ever tried starting an independent union? Well, yes, they did try. And what happened? They got 20 years. <laughs> you see what I mean about discipline? So you, you, you never feel it's your duty, perhaps, to encourage the Chinese to be more like the West, to, to bring up... You, you don't want to bring up the lack of human rights or of free press or the absence of genuine party politics? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> they think that gets in the way of making money. And I'm with them 100% on that. It is not just that, is it? Just because there are no political parties and no free press doesn't necessarily mean the economy will boom. No, but I wouldn't miss party politics, to be honest. Well, well really not. I mean, it's the foundation of our democracy, surely. No, but I think... What a relief it would be not to have to listen to Nick Clegg's views <laughs> on interest rates <laughs> or on anything else. <laughs> And you'd be spared the Today programme with self-important people sounding off, you know, just the sport and the weather. It must be something you can't possibly approve of, surely. I mean, for one thing, what about pollution of the environment? Look, China has to go through what we did a couple of hundred years ago. And they're a very civilised, sensitive people. Mm. If you go to a dinner party in Hampstead, you don't say to your host, your lavatory isn't very clean. I suggest you get some harpic. <laughs> well, you, 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 seem, you seem very committed to China. Well, I am. It's a great place. And I want to do my bit for what is, after all, a very ancient culture. But the future isn't all plain sailing, is it? I mean, if they have, well, for instance, to revalue the currency, already their exports are shrinking. Uh, a lot of the firms are going bust. There are big concerns about inflation. All that could lead to serious social unrest. Well, I'll be gone by then. Gone? <laughs> oh, yes. I'll set up somewhere else where people will be willing to work for peanuts. I've got my eye on Bangladesh. Ooh. <laughs>